Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today I wanted to talk to you about narcissists and financial abuse. This is something that many people deal with, so I thought we could address it on the show today. Many people think that if someone is not hitting them or calling them names, they're not being abused. This is actually not correct. There are several different types of abuse, physical, verbal, emotional, or psychological, and financial, among others. Physical abuse involves things like physical violence, physical intimidation, throwing things, threats, and other things like that. Verbal abuse involves things like name-calling, insults, put-downs, nasty sarcasm, and other ways that a person can use words to hurt somebody. Emotional or psychological abuse, as it is sometimes called, often occurs with verbal abuse or physical abuse, and it involves things like manipulation, using guilt, fear, or anger to control somebody, emotional strong-arming and emotional blackmail, threats of self-harm or suicide to control other people, gaslighting, threats to abandon the relationship if you don't do what they say, and many other tactics that we're all very familiar with. Financial abuse involves things like cutting off financial support, stopping people from working, stealing from you, controlling or taking your money, controlling joint or family money unfairly, spending money to create a crisis or to punish other people, refusing to follow a budget, and other things where money is used to control, hurt, or punish others. Financial abuse is very common in narcissistic relationships. It's usually part and parcel of the overall controlling, abusive climate of life with a narcissist. Financial abuse is another way to control and diminish the other person or people in the relationship. Finances and money are an important part of security and independence in our culture. If you have no money or no access to money, it's very hard to feel secure. If you have no money or no access to money, you might become stuck in a situation with no way to leave. Financial abuse is often one of the key ways that abusers attempt to keep people in the relationship or the situation. If you have no money, it's hard to leave. This is one of the biggest reasons we hear that people cannot exit the relationship. They either don't have the money, they don't have access to the money, or they have other people that are financially dependent on them, such as children. It's important to remember, too, that financial abuse doesn't just involve controlling, taking, or stopping others from earning money. It can also be refusing to share expenses, support themselves, or contribute to the finances in general. It can be insisting that others are required to care for them financially. It can involve taking money from others without permission and then insisting that it's not stealing. It can be spending recklessly, borrowing money, taking out loans, or otherwise creating financial crises and catastrophes for the whole family or everybody involved. It can involve harassing, bullying, manipulating, guilting, threatening, terrorizing, or throwing tantrums to try to force people to give them money or to buy them things. Any situation where money, access to money, or control of money is used to hurt, punish, and or undermine someone's security is a situation of financial abuse. Many narcissistic people are very blatant about financial abuse. They might proclaim that no one else is smart enough, responsible enough, savvy enough, or whatever else, and that's why they need to control the money. They might be really vicious about controlling it, taking pleasure in creating situations where people are forced to ask or even beg for money for basic things. They might offer money and support if and only if they can control the person receiving the money. For example, a parent who will only pay for college if the child follows the exact career path that the parent wants them to follow. Some blatantly refuse to pay bills or refuse to allow their victimized spouse or family member to pay them. They may constantly talk about how much they do for others financially or about how much everybody owes them. They may say that because they have lent money or given financial support that now they should be able to have a say in how other people run their lives. Others are more subtle or passive-aggressive. For example, a narcissist spends recklessly and creates a situation where there's not enough money for the bills. Then they attack the victim or the victims as selfish and cruelly withholding for being upset or angry about the narcissist's actions. They may insist that too much is being made of their spending, that it's not that big of a deal, that they're being treated unfairly, or that they don't matter, or that they're being abused because others are refusing to spend any money on them. The fact that they've created a serious problem doesn't matter and is not addressed. They may insist that others are being overdramatic just to hurt them or that there's other money hidden somewhere and people are just being mean for the sake of being mean. 
Pathologically narcissistic people engage in financially abusive behavior not just because they're controlling and power seeking, but also because they're so often childish, selfish, irresponsible, and inconsiderate. They are prone to magical thinking. They believe that there's enough money or that there's more money somewhere or that something will happen to make everything all right because they want these things to be true and for no other reason. When this magical thing does not happen to make everything okay, in spite of their selfishness, withholding, or incompetence, as it often doesn't, they don't seem to realize or care that the problem was anything that they did wrong. They look around for something or someone else to blame it on, and they can usually find what they're looking for. Often, this someone to blame is the victim. Because they view people as objects and as extensions of themselves, they see no reason that they should have to share anything that's theirs or ask for anything that isn't. Living with financial abuse can be extremely demoralizing and traumatic. The victim is abused, then gaslighted and told that what they're experiencing is not abuse, while simultaneously being blamed for the abuse that they are being told is not happening. There may also be multiple situations where someone is humiliated by financial abuse. For example, not having enough money at the grocery store, being forced to beg the abuser or perform tasks in order to get money to buy food or other essentials, needing to borrow money from others because of the abuser's reckless spending or withholding, having to call utility companies or landlords and try to persuade them not to turn the utilities off or not to go ahead with an eviction. There can be financial catastrophes that the abuser hides or tries to keep a secret, and when these things are finally unable to be hidden any longer, they come as a huge shock. This is extremely traumatic. For example, if the abuser has lost their job but doesn't tell the family or loses all of their savings in a bad investment or while gambling. Maybe they pretended to pay the rent but weren't actually doing so. Then when the eviction comes, the rest of the family is not just shocked, but they're completely unprepared. And worse, they have nowhere to go. We often find that these situations continue to happen again and again and again. The narcissist does not learn. The family may have just dug themselves out of a financial hole only to find that the abuser's reckless, selfish, or controlling ways have pushed them right back into it again. Or a person may be just starting to feel secure and stable again only to find that the narcissist has become angry with them and cut off their own access to their own money once again. The abuser may have bought them a reliable car as a gift so they can get to work, then constantly threaten to have it repossessed or even do so as a punishment for not doing exactly what was wanted. The abuser may insist they don't have to pay rent or contribute to the household because they've paid enough by dealing with the supposed horrific mistreatment of them. They may create situations so that the victim cannot work or do things to get them fired. They may repeatedly sabotage their own employment. The list goes on and on. There are many, many ways that financial abuse can manifest. People living with financial abuse often develop chronic food, shelter, or general financial insecurity where they constantly fear that there will not be enough of something or that it will be taken away somehow. They may develop extreme anxiety in this area and even thinking about money or finances can become a trigger for them. Their basic sense of security or stability has often been completely undermined to the point where they cannot relax. This kind of abuse is insidious and destructive. Not only does it create chronic financial insecurities and rob people of feeling safe, but it often creates situations where the victim themselves can become extremely controlling regarding the money in a desperate attempt to stop the narcissist from using it as a weapon. They may deny the narcissist access to bank accounts, take their name off of accounts, take debit cards away, or do other things to try and restrict spending in an effort to stop the narcissist from creating these financial catastrophes or stop them from withholding. This can lead to confusion for other people about who the abuser actually is in the relationship, which is devastating for the victim who is already continuously being blamed for everything. The truth is, if someone does not treat you as an equal person with equal access to the funds, or if you feel that you have to restrict their access to the funds like a child, this is not a healthy relationship. If someone harasses you for hours or even days for money, if they refuse to contribute their fair share to the household, if someone takes your money without asking, if they use guilt, manipulation, or terrorize you to get you to give them money or get out of contributing their fair share, if someone uses money to hurt, punish, or control you in any way, this is not a healthy relationship. 
Our partners and our family members are not responsible for taking care of us as adults and we're not responsible for them. But when we enter into an agreement or a partnership with somebody, such as a marriage, sharing finances or sharing a home, they are required to hold up their end of a fair bargain, whatever the bargain is that we've come up with. When they don't do that, it's not okay. If you find yourself in this situation, it can be extremely difficult to get out. However, you deserve to be treated as an adult and an equal partner in the relationship, whether it's a marriage, a romantic relationship, a family situation, or a friendship. You deserve to feel safe, secure, and free from harassment, bullying, and being terrorized. You deserve better. You really do. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via Skype, via messenger, and through email. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the book and appointment tab to go ahead and do that. I teach workshops once a month, so if you're interested in seeing what we have running right now, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the little shaman. May the great spirit bless you and have a wonderful day.